Welcome to The Roundtable, a podcast of Lakeside Church. We hope today's discussion leaves you encouraged. For more information on how to connect, please visit our website, lakesidechurch.ca. Well, hey, friends, we're back again for another week of The Roundtable. I'm joined by Jeff Grunewald and Robin Elliott, and uh, really excited to continue to dig in. This is our podcast from Lakeside Church, and uh, we just like to uh, kind of tackle some of the questions that come in, whether related to the message from the previous week or uh, the entire series or just things that are going on in the world around us. And uh, we're going to get into a lot of things going around us today. That's where the questions that came in uh, really were pointing to, which is going to be, I think, a fun conversation. But my, the best question we got in the last two weeks was actually this question that read, where's the round table this week? Because if you noticed, uh, and if you noticed, we feel so loved. Last week, we didn't have a round table. And it was actually missed. And I don't know, did you guys feel that? Like, I, my heart was warmed by that question. Mark, Mark, it's a thing that goes on at Lakeside. They, they wait for the Monday Five as well. And if that doesn't come out on Monday, boy, there's trouble. Guys, it's just, <laughs> it's so special I to feel it. wanted. Did, I missed the round table. Did you miss the round table? I did, I did, yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's fun. I reached the end of the week and I was like, why am I not as stressed as I normally am? <laughs> I felt like I had more bandwidth to deal with the different things going on that week, but uh, always a joy to be able to chat with you guys. And I just figured, let's just jump right in uh, and pull up the questions here. So the first question was uh, related to, you know, relationships in the midst of this. How do we handle the division among people in regards to COVID? Uh, because different opinions, I guess, have caused some division. Some people, this is the person's words, are on board, but there are others that aren't buying it. There are people that feel like the government's lying to us. This person says, that's not me. Um, but I feel like people are losing friends over this. Uh, Robin, let's start with you. What do we do about the division that's caused when we have different views on topics like this? Yeah, well, this is just one of many, right? There's all kinds of issues that we can uh, choose to disagree on. But I think when I hear words like division and losing relationships, that's where the red flags go up for me. Uh, and it really saddens me because I just think that as Jesus followers and as those who belong to the body of Christ, the church, that's the last thing that should happen amongst us. We can disagree on all kinds of things, but there shouldn't be division. And I think, you know, there's all kinds of instructions in the New Testament and modeling about how we respect other people, how we're kind in our speech, which doesn't mean we have to agree. It does mean, though, that um, we have to set a table where we can have a conversation that's respectful. And, you know, I've had just this is just a, a one off example that, or a little uh, exercise that I sometimes use. I'm not always very good at it, but um, I've had some contentious relationships in the past in the church um well yeah come on mark don't go really (laughs) (laughs) whenever you're in leadership or or ministry that happens and whenever i was having those conversations i could feel my stomach like just get in knots and i would visually imagine i was speaking to my best friend instead of this person Mm -hmm. and it helped to change my um just my attitude and my whole demeanor so i would pretend as though i'm actually speaking to a really dear friend uh even though we're having this disagreement and i just think if you know if we can come into these conversations in love and kindness and respect there doesn't have to be division we we're not responsible for their reaction if they choose to walk away from the relationship because of the difference there's not much we can do about that but what we can do is is our demeanor and and how we engage that conversation well wow. i think uh, i really resonate with that and robin and uh, just an easy thing to say in a conversation when somebody brings an opinion that's different than the one you have you might be able to say in response to that person thank you for sharing your view on that i i'm not sure what i think about that or thank you for sharing your view on that i may have a different view and try to uh, respond in that way. And the other person may be interested in knowing what your particular point of view is or not. And I think it's that same idea of just modeling that we can have uh, respect for one another and we can uh, hold different opinions, different views. We can even hold the view that I haven't figured out what my view is on this yet. Yeah. And you know, Mark, you preached a few weeks ago and you used you know, um, uniformity versus unity. 
And I think that really does sum it up. I mean, I can't believe for a minute that everybody in the New Testament church agreed on, well, we, we have evidence that they didn't, <laughs> but we also have evidence of Paul and other writers just saying, hey, you have to love through this, right? You have to honor one another and respect. And I think that's what should set us apart mm. from the world is that we can disagree and love each other through it. And if we can't do that, I don't know. One of the things about the, basics. One of the things <laughs> about the, the COVID-19 part of that question, Mark, I think that's important is that uh, people are saying, uh, well, I think I can have friends over. Someone says, no, no, you can't have friends over. Someone says, well, I think I need to wear a mask in this place. Someone else says, no, I don't need to wear a mask and you, sh you shouldn't have to wear a mask either. And don't you know that the government's lying to you about all of that kind of thing? I think for, for Christians, one principle that can uh, feed into this is a little bit that we always want to keep in mind that we are for, for others, people's best. And even if that means that we ourselves sacrifice a little bit of freedom that we might otherwise enjoy, for the sake of the well-being of somebody else, that's okay. Yeah. Wow. Let me let me circle back on two things that each of you said that I was like, that's noteworthy. I got my pen. I'm like, I need a notebook because that was so good. I love that practical tip, Robin, of like picturing them as a best friend before you engage. Tell me, what does that do for your posture and the way you dialogue with someone that you're like maybe first fuming at and now picturing as a friend? How does that change the dynamic? And, and it's, just, it's a psychological game, right? Yeah. That's what it is. I'm just playing a game in my head. And it yeah. just, for me, it's, it's settled my, my physical state because I don't know, depending on the levels of contentiousness you guys have engaged with, some, like it can, it can affect me um, physically. Yeah. And um, so it just, it settles me, like it settles right. me. And then mentally and spiritually, it brings me into a place where I'm more lovingly ready to engage them in conversation. And so I think we naturally go into contentious conversations with prejudiced views of what we believe they already think or what they're gonna say or what they mean by what they say. When I envision someone that I love dearly and they're a best friend, that comes away because I can listen more openly and mm. not with that prejudice, uh, slanted, jaded <laughs> view. Mm. And that's, that's really the Jesus way, right? That's how you would want to be treated if someone saw you as the other with the, right. the out there perspective, maybe they might label it, but you'd say, I, I want you to hear my heart. I want you to understand uh, my thought process and the values associated with this. And so that's just, um, that's just the Jesus model. I love that. That's such a good uh, handhold for how to act in those moments. Jeff, you said something I thought was really helpful. And I'm thinking a lot about our young adults who often you know, this has just been my experience, especially in dialoguing with them. And um, when having kind of theological wrestlings, there's not a category for placing a bookmark and saying, I'm not sure I agree. And I'm not sure what I believe. And that to me is a gift that you're giving our community to be able to sometimes not have to buy in right away and not get pressured or bullied into. And don't you know, and I have a verse for this. And if you don't believe the Bible, you know, you don't believe the Bible if you don't believe this, right? It's like, oh, um, I just thought that was a really neat thing. Uh, so those are great, great pieces of advice as dialoguing, sometimes in the midst of tense uh, disagreements. Um, let's go to the other part, which is, is the government lying to us? Let's just figure this government conspiracy out once and for all. <laughs> Over to you, Jeff. Jeffrey? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'd have to say I've watched my fair share of government conspiracy movies, and I tend to love those kinds of themes about who's telling the truth and whether there's an alternative story going on. So I can definitely sympathize with that. But I think as Christians, we have some additional pieces of information that help us understand things like there is a spiritual reality in the world, this battle between good and evil. And we try to read that into our present circumstances. And it's always uh, a task of our day and our generation and our ourselves as believers to try and sort out, is this a spiritual force of evil here? Is this just something that's going on in society that's not necessarily spiritual? And we try to wrestle those things out. And I think that's, uh, that's an important responsibility that we have. Mm. I think the scriptures also do teach the idea that government authorities are put there by God for our good. And that's another perspective not to forget. So I don't think it's as easy as saying the government's evil and corrupt all the time. They're always lying to us. 
but at the same time there are examples of uh, times when when Christians have needed to stand against the the evil of the uh, ruling powers of the day yeah and I think that's I like that I like that it's you know again it's not I have a verse for this and it's black and white there's a discernment element that is important for the Jesus followers and I think our next questions will lead us to that uh, with questions about civil disobedience and that kind of stuff. And the reality is there's times in history where Christians practicing civil disobedience have brought forth great change. So, um, yeah, great things to wrestle with in this time. So um, this person gives a specific example about a church recently in Ontario that decided to defy the orders and have drive-in services. Uh, they were warned not to, and they did anyways. Um, and they, you know, uh, did it as, as safely as they could, windows up and, you know, everybody distanced, but um, they were, and this person who asked the question says, you know, to me, it's kind of like they're at a Costco parking lot. So the person who's asking the question says, I, I kind of understand what they're saying, um, but the way about it, they, they felt like it left a bad taste in their mouth. They're like, it feels like they're giving Christians a bad name. And uh, I just, this is what the person says, I just want some help working through that. Um, so, Jeff, let's throw it over to you this time on this one. What what do you make of that? That I mean, we've all read read yeah. that in the news of what's happening with that church and different different things. And our well, I just wish uh, I wish that instead of the church in Elmer, it could have been the church up in Guelph called Lakeside Church that gave the order to do that, and then we could have just seen what would happen. It would have been easier to work through, and especially if it would have been you, Mark, who gave the order. Uh, <laughs> Only kidding, only kidding. Um, but I think what's important to, to dig a little bit further into this question and ask what's being challenged by the government when we're being asked not to meet. And you all know the regulations about whether we can meet with uh, groups of five and not to gather in person. We closed our building back in March and so forth. Yeah. I would take the position that what, what is being challenged is for the good of everyone, we're being asked not to gather. And, and what's at issue here is the form of how we practice our faith, not our faith itself. No one is saying you can't believe. No one's saying it's wrong or illegal to believe. We're being asked not to meet on Sundays or other days in the ways that we're accustomed to. And I'm okay with that because my faith isn't based on the form of how we practice it. So then here's a question. Is it is it okay then to just, because civil disobedience. I mean, people will pull out verses from the scriptures. It's like, hey, you've told us not to, but we can't help but tell people about Jesus. So it is our right. It is our faith. We're going forward, ignoring what the government has to say. What do we do with that? Well, I think, Robin, you had a few examples from history of people that have stepped out in, in ways that have been marvelous in civil disobedience. Yeah, I mean, I think we, you know, there's two things going on here. We, when we think of the underground church, say in the USSR back in the 70s and 80s and Romania and, now, and even presently China, uh, those people meet uh, at great risk to themselves. Um, you, yes, they are defying the government, but they are not putting other people's lives at risk. I think when we look at this particular situation, they're asking us, really, they're not you could say they're demanding, but they're really asking for cooperation from the whole population to just be, be cognizant of others and the, and the potential spread. When we see churches defying um, their authorities and meeting, it's, it's their own skin on the line. They'll be tortured, they'll be killed. Mm. Um, we see, um, you know, we've seen... Um, <laughs> even, with, even with the Nazis, right? Like yeah. rescuing yeah. Jews, that uh, wasn't legal, and yet Christians no. did it. Yeah. Um, but it was to save lives, not risk lives. Exactly. Think, uh, and it was their it. own neck again. It was their own skin yeah. on the line, right? It wasn't someone else's. And um, yeah, so I think when we when we look at some of these examples in history, um, we we can we need to discern the spirit of what was going on, of who was being defended, of whose rights were being um, violated and, and also stood up for. And, and we tend to, and I think it's because of our democracy, which is lovely, but we tend to always default back to our rights, our rights, our mm -hmm. rights. And I think we need to maybe as Christians pause a little longer and say, wait a minute, whose rights are being violated and why am I being offended? Am I, is my faith actually being challenged here or just uh, my preferences? 
And that um, brings up the question of one's conscience and how one wrestles that out. And it's not as easy as saying, here's the right way and here's the wrong way or the right or wrong perspective on the matter. Over the years, Andrea and I have had the privilege of meeting many Middle Eastern Christians who practice their faith under oppressive Muslim regimes where they are definitely in the minority. And that's so unlike our Canadian situation where we practice our faith. But there's an art to practicing one's faith when on a daily basis you might be arrested. When if you become a Christian out of a Muslim background, you might be ostracized from your faith, pre uh, prevented from uh, buying a home or, or getting a job. Um, you might be persecuted, put in jail, or even killed for your faith. And so I marvel at some of our Middle Eastern friends on how they navigate that and they find ways to conceal their activities, which would definitely be a form of civil disobedience. But they've done that because they feel, they feel their faith is at issue. It's being threatened here, and they choose as a matter of conscience to practice what they believe to be faithfully from God, just like Daniel in the Old Testament when he says, it's a matter of conscience that I don't follow this order to bow down um, in the way that you're asking me to do. Yeah. And it's messy, right? Like we'd love yeah. it to be just so clean and black and white. But I mean, I grew up with the book, uh, God Smuggler. And again, in the time people would smuggle Bibles across the borders in Europe. Yeah. Well, you're breaking the law because the law <laughs> says you can't bring those Bibles in. Some would do it without saying anything and risk their own lives. Others would actually, you know, lie about it. Either way, I think when you're concealing something and violating a law, it, it, it's, it's almost the same thing. But they wrestled with that. They, you know, it wasn't black and white. Here's a verse. Here's a verse. Because yeah. each side could, could pull a verse. It was, it was Holy Spirit, like, what is our obligation here? Um, mm -hmm lead us and guide us and it's a discernment thing and i don't think any one of us really are in the position to point fingers and yeah and so, judge right and so in the case of covid 19 a person could invoke their spiritual authority as maybe the question act asker is suggesting that i follow a higher authority than the government authority in the in the country of canada or the province of ontario or wherever ha you happen to live and say that I choose as a matter of conscience to defy this order that's being given by the government. You'd have to uh, wrestle through that to whether you really thought that that was being faithful to what God was asking you to be. And I think in the case of the Aylmer Church, they certainly felt it was a matter of conscience. I don't feel it's a matter of conscience for me to have us prevented from gathering currently at Lakeside. I don't feel my faith is being challenged. In fact, I find that my faith and the faith of many in our church is deepening in ways that were unexpected and a blessing in ways that I hadn't anticipated uh, during this time. So, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting one without an easy answer, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that, uh, so let's, let's throw another wrench in this conversation. There's also, yeah, <laughs> there's also now a document that has gone to our premier signed by hundreds of churches. I think last check, over 400 churches in Ontario that signed it basically uh, gently, but asking to start meeting again um, and making that a, a, a very high priority. Um, we aren't on that. We didn't sign it. Um, was that our act of disobedience? <laughs> I don't know. But how uh, this is, I think, the thing that I've been wrestling with is um, we are going to stand before our creator one day and we're going to give account for the things that we fought for. And I don't know that I want to be known as the person who fought to have the right to go and be in my building and have a coffee. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd really want to be known as uh, a pastor who said, you know what, uh, our people who are struggling with addictions, if there's a way that we can creatively find a way for our AA groups or our Celebrate Recovery that we have at Lakeside uh, to meet, because those people in isolation, like those to me are, are plights worth taking on. And so I just think um, one day we're going to stand before God and give account to it. And to me, I'm not, I don't want to have to stand before him and say, yeah, I made sure that we all could be back in the room quicker than the health professionals thought wise. Yeah. I think one of the, uh, one of the side door issues that's connected to this is that we're all taking a little bit of offense as followers of Jesus, that our particular endeavor in the world of practicing our faith is not considered an essential service. And you know what, friends, that's good for us um, yeah. to recognize that we in our generation have somehow let our faith become 
uh, almost irrelevant to the world around us and asking ourselves the question, how do we regain that relevance to the world around us? The beautiful, attractional Christian message that we, that we live out every day, how do we regain that in the world? Those are some of the really important questions that are being discussed these days. Um, and circles uh, Robin, back to you. Sorry, circles yeah, back you to you. In, in your um, in your work with small groups, you're probably seeing groups that are wrestling out some of those questions. How do they make it real where they are? Mm -hmm. And you know, thankfully, we have a technological platform, right? So for the most part, that's what people are doing. And you know, we've seen even on the news people dropping gifts at doors. I don't think that's illegal. I think it's creative. Um, some people would take offense to that because you're not supposed to leave your home except for an essential reason. You're not supposed to exchange articles with, with others. But I don't know, I just think what a beautiful creative expression of, of, of love. And I think it, it does circle back to what you said earlier, Jeff, about form and function though. Um, you know, we don't wanna conflate an essential service with having to meet at a particular building at a particular time. Uh, and, and I think that's where we may be getting ourselves into trouble. You know, when it comes, as Mark, as you said, I don't want to be known for, when it comes to an example like the Aylmer Church, I, I would want to ask ourselves, what's our posture and why is our posture this way? How does it reflect on the name of Jesus? Um, does it reflect badly on Jesus' reputation or does it reflect positively? And I suppose there's opinions all across the board on that, but that would be the question I would want to be wrestling with. The government hasn't said you can never meet again. They're, they're in uncharted territory, right? No, they're doing yeah. the best they can and we, we should be there supporting and I don't know. Yeah, I, and I, I think part of that is, and Jeff pointed this out earlier, like, it's like that's old news in the sense of the government has now said you can have drive-in services so in some way they were on the cutting edge of creativity and figuring out ways to do it safely um but it, it did bring up a, a good conversation that i think christians should be wrestling with which is is there a time when civil disobedience is okay and is this the right time and um by no means are we uh, judging this church that's in the news we don't know them i, I, don't, I don't know them from adam uh but it was a, I think this is a safe space on the round table to wrestle through as Jesus followers. How do we move forward? When we hear this going on, we don't just ignore it. We want to figure this out. And so, um, yeah, that's our desire. Jeff, you're going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, I was on a call earlier today and uh, a person from outside of our own church circle was asking me, Hey, you know, what are you learning? What are you thinking at this time? And he asked me the question, um, have I concluded possibly, have I concluded that, you know, all the technology ways that we use to meet are so good and so compelling that we never need to meet again at the church. And in fact, we're, I don't even know if we're going to meet again. Maybe we'll just sell the whole facility and just go online all the time. And I, w I started laughing when he asked me that question because guys, I can't wait till we can get back in our facility. It's a place where we meet and connect with each other. We hug each other. We Creativity emerges in powerful ways when you're physically sitting across the table or beside someone on their seat. Can't wait to see people that I haven't seen in a while. I called somebody today that I just thought of somebody. I haven't seen those people in a while. I think I'll call them. It's okay, but I can't wait to get back. So don't worry, friends. We're not selling the building. Um, we already <laughs> sold one building. We're not selling the other one. <laughs> Well, it's amazing what happens in times like this that cause us to really wrestle through our faith, to think through our faith. I don't know if any of you have had like a personal crisis moment in the last nine weeks where you wrestle with, what are we doing? Why do we do it? What am I doing? Um, but I think that's actually, uh, let's not wish this away. I mean, I wish COVID-19 away. We, Robin's like, yes, let's, but um Let's realize that we're in this space and sit with the things that we're wrestling with, have good dialogues, even in the limitations of technology, because I think this is a good thing. And the things that we will learn in this season are going to serve us for generations. Um, a lot of the questions that are coming up right now, I don't know that we've ever tackled these as Canadians. When is it right to have, in my generation, we haven't, civil disobedience. Um, so yeah, these are good things to be wrestling through. So grateful for you guys and the time that you've given just to, uh, talk a little bit more about it and looking forward to be back next week. And uh, so please feel free to send in your questions as always. You can do that on social media 
or on our website, just email any of us and we'll make sure that it gets on the roster. Thanks Maybe so much, what, guys. Can, oh. What we can do is uh, if you have ideas for creative ways of, of being civilly disobedient, you can email them to Mark Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeffrey. <laughs> have a great week, guys. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.